Hello, my friends. How are you? Welcome to season two of 30 albums for 30 years, 1964 through 1994. In this podcast, I take a chronological look at the 30 most impactful albums during those years. I do that chronologically. So this episode begins an evaluation of the most impactful albums released in 1965. I am your host, J.B. Sweet. So to give you a little context on where we are with the program, in only a few months, the show is now being heard in 26 different countries with listenership growing rapidly, making 30 albums for 30 years one of the fastest growing music podcasts on the market. Most recently, we've added listeners in Albania, Puerto Rico, Kenya, France, and India. I would like to welcome them to the show. The first album for discussion is John Coltrane's A Love Supreme. Released on Impulse Records, it was recorded on December 9th, 1964, and released in January of 1965. I must admit that evaluating this album gave me a certain degree of anxiety because it is so monumental. And it's so personal to so many people, including myself. I feel a great responsibility to present it with as much accuracy and clarity as possible. So in order to get to the true meaning and the specific details regarding A Love Supreme, I was fortunate enough to speak with John Coltrane expert, Ashley Kahn, who I will introduce to you shortly. Given the length of the episode, I have split it into two parts. Part one will include some basic details on John Coltrane leading up to the record and my discussion with Ashley. Part two will offer my impressions of the record, followed by a track-by-track analysis of this brilliant four-part suite. So make yourself comfortable and open up your ears, your mind, and your heart as we take this spiritual journey into the brilliance of John Coltrane and the album, A Love Supreme. So let's talk about the record. John Coltrane's A Love Supreme is not just a brilliant album, it's an experience. And for myself and many others, it's a life altering experience. The four-part suite takes us into the light of Coltrane's spiritual awakening. A Love Supreme represents John Coltrane, jazz's ultimate preacher, at the peak of his creative journey with his classic quartet. It is music that can only be created by a visionary, such as John Coltrane, a man possessed by finding self-realization through the study of music and religion. Supporting Train are his apostles, McCoy Tyner on piano, Jimmy Garrison on bass, and Elvin Jones on drums. Each part of the suite represents a different phase of John Coltrane's musical and ethereal quest. A Love Supreme offers a personal experience that transcends, and I urge you to listen to it in its entirety, without distractions. Enjoying A Love Supreme in the right environment will alter your musical DNA forever and change you as a person. So I covered John Coltrane quite a bit in season number one, but it is essential to understand the man, to understand his music, particularly on A Love Supreme. So here we go. John Coltrane was born and raised in Hamlet, North Carolina in 1926. In 1938, his father, his uncle, and his grandparents died within just a few months, and his mother and aunt mainly raised him. By 1940, John Coltrane began studying the saxophone. And in 1943, he moved to Philadelphia. In 1945, John Coltrane entered the Navy and played in a band with local service members. A year later, 1946, he was back in Philadelphia and began working as a sideman, most notably with Eddie Cleanhead Vinson, Dizzy Gillespie, and Johnny Hodges. But still, few really knew of John Coltrane at this point. His big break came when he began working as a member of Miles Davis's group in 1955. Davis was rebuilding his career at this time 
after recovering from a heroin addiction. As a member of Davis's first great quintet, John Coltrane was included on such classic albums as Cookin', Relaxin', Workin', and Steamin'. His playing with Miles showcased a searching quality and a move to a concept in which he would often play longer phrases to fill space. This contrasted perfectly with Miles Davis's more fragmented approach to phrasing and improvisation. But then John Coltrane began dealing with his own addictions, uh, mainly heroin addiction. So unhappy with his production and his tardiness, Miles Davis unceremoniously fired John Coltrane in early 1957. To clean up, Coltrane returned to Philadelphia where he began a period of self-reflection. And this included the studying of world mu music and world religion. During this period, John Coltrane worked as a member of Thelonious Monk's band, and he also began recording as a leader. In 1958, he rejoined Miles Davis. And after recording the classic, A Kind of Blue, 1959 with Miles Davis, Coltrane released his own masterpiece with an album called Giant Steps. The album was a tremendous showcase of Coltrane's advanced harmonic and melodic concepts and his compositions. In 1960, John Coltrane formed his first quartet. With the group, he released the classic My Favorite Things in 1961. By 1962, he had solidified the lineup that would become known as his own first classic quartet. This included McCoy Tyner on piano, Elvin Jones on drums, and Jimmy Garrison on bass. The saxophonist began experimenting now with free jazz concepts and elongated solo expressions all supported by his masterful group. By 1964, the quartet was at its creative peak, and the result can be heard on live releases such as Crescent and Live at Birdland. In December of 1964, the group recorded the masterpiece, the album we are discussing today, A Love Supreme. So now that I've given you some history on John Coltrane, I'd like to introduce my very special guest, Ashley Kahn. Ashley Kahn is an author, an educator, a music journalist, and a concert promoter. He's also a professor of music history and criticism at NYU, and he also lectures at other institutions as well. His books include A Love Supreme, the story of John Coltrane's signature album, and Kind of Blue, the making of the Miles Davis masterpiece. Khan's writings have generated two Grammy nominations. He frequently speaks, presents, and conducts interviews at a variety of festivals and conferences, and during his 30-year career in the music business, he has helped to produce and promote endless concerts, tours, and festivals, including a 10-year stint as tour manager for a multitude of musical groups, such as Paul Simon, Peter Gabriel, Debbie Harry, it's Blondie, and Britney Spears. He continues to work very closely with the Miles Davis family on various projects as well, including a Miles Davis Museum exhibit, tribute concerts, and various panels and speaking engagements. I first met Ashley while on a panel with him at Monmouth University to discuss Miles Davis's album, Kind of Blue, and then a second time to discuss John Coltrane's A Love Supreme, the album that we will talk about today. So it was fantastic to reconnect with Ashley, and based on our correspondence after this interview, he seemed to enjoy the conversation as well. So here it is, check it out, my conversation with Ashley Kahn. Hey there. How are you, Ashley? Good. Good. Thanks for joining. Of course. So I wanted to uh, pattern this discussion around the album, A Love Supreme, of course, which <laughs> you wrote this fantastic book about it. Which I just I've seen about. that before. <laughs> yeah, me too. I've read it now probably three or four times. But, um, and just the genius of the album and John Coltrane himself. So um, first, let me just ask, what prompted you to write the book? Well, what prompted it was the popularity of doing a 
kind of fine focus on one recording, uh, which had, I, you know, which the model of that was my previous book on Miles Davis's kind of blue, uh, on which, you know, John Coltrane is such an important voice and, um, you know, creative spirit who added to that uh, particular masterpiece. But the idea of specificity, of going deep into one recording rather than trying to do the usual cradle to grave, you know, kind of coverage of of a um, uh, you know, musical force like John Coltrane, when every few months, you know, his direction would change. Every few months, there was a different set of priorities he was dealing with. So to try and encompass all of that, um, and not just on a musical level, but on a sociological, cultural level, racial, you know, level, um, you know, was very important to me too. And so it it made more sense to speak his world through a single, you know, the the proverbial single grain of sand, you know, idea. But, um, you know, he gave us a gift. He gave us a, uh, a one recording, which he announced as pretty much being his kind of self-portrait. This is my statement. This is my message. Not every, you know, uh, musical, you know, genius you know, and does that. And not every musical genius will actually take the time to explain in writing what's going on in the music, the reason for doing it. And all of that is pretty much, you know, on the cover of A Love Supreme. And that's really, you know, an amazing uh, thing to think about because nowadays uh, uh, anyone engaged in musical expression pardon me, has a multitude of formats and media through which to speak and announce. Back then, you had the album, what was the music that was on the recording, and then the album packaging. And right. that was it. You know, there was no social media. There was no other, there were no TV shows upon which he was, you know, expecting to go and speak and like, oh, here's uh, so-and-so speaking about their, you know, most recent uh, recording. The closest that came to that in Coltrane's lifetime was with Ralph Gleason and the, and the you know, TV show that he was putting together in the Bay Area mm-hmm. called Jazz Casual. Yeah. That's the closest and and the coverage, you know, and that he was pretty get private. Him. He didn't like to interview much to begin with. I think, right? A pretty private guy in, in that sense. Yeah, he was very tight lipped. He was, uh, you know, you you do not hear stage announcements, and live recordings of John Coltrane at all. He's not even giving credit to his sidemen. He is letting the music speak for itself. So a love supreme also stands out in the in the sense that you know here's John Coltrane taking the podium and mm-hmm. and making the most of that little moment that he has with his listeners and uh if you look at the amount of words you know yeah. that he wrote out and the fact that he included a poem which kind of encapsulates his life philosophy at that point you know, and it was something that was in progress. He was still in progress and kind of developing this personal philosophy, taking bits and pieces of his, you know, Judeo-Christian background and applying it to um, uh, little, you know, um, influences and big influences from Eastern um, paths of of spirituality. Uh, He had read the Bhagavad Gita, you know, Mm -hmm. he had read other um, you know, um, uh, scriptures, you know, important writings on Eastern spirituality as well. That brings up a good point. And it's funny for me, I look at, if you try to break down the album, the brilliance of the album, which some things are beyond analysis, right? There's these four main factors for me, one of which being his connectivity with spirituality and religion. And, um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to that point, particularly like um, when he goes through this period in, I think, 1957. 
Yeah, well, he talks about that in the liner notes. He says, you know, I hit this very special moment in 1957. The outside proof of this is, of course, him getting clean. You know, Mm -hmm. in April of that year, he goes cold turkey. And during what must have been a horrendous uh, week in Philadelphia, he leaves New York, goes to Philadelphia. And while staying at his mother's place, um, he kicks you know, his his uh, narcotic addiction, um, cold turkey, while performing right. and uh, at a place called the Red Rooster in um, in Philadelphia and just probably was using music as the kind of distraction from all of the uh, issues that come with, you know, the DTs that mm-hmm. come with um, getting clean. Um, but And he talks about, you know, kind of rededicating his his spiritual life. I, I just want to be very careful about using the word religion here, because if there's one thing that's very clear, uh, at least to me, I mean, because it is open to interpretation, the God that he's talking about is a uh, universal kind of approach, the idea of deity or divine spirit um, in, uh, in his poem, especially in his poem on love supreme um and the fact that he is giving equal um kind of thrust to the words and the and the word of the the kind of language that one would expect from biblical you know uh uh, background to other more eastern metaphysical concepts all of that is woven together and then he makes this a very telling statement that all paths lead to God. Well, this is a very non-exclusive kind of uh, all access, uh, all, I'll try that again, (laughs) all access pass to connecting with the divine, which is not, you know, most, most religions insist on the kind of one way approach to all of their adherence. You know, so if you're part of, you know, um, uh, a certain church or synagogue or mosque or whatever your path is, there is this idea that you are on the right path and all the other paths are not correct. And I believe in his way, John Coltrane is really espousing a universalist, capital U, approach you know, that allows anyone anywhere on the planet to, you know, become part of this divine connection. And that is his primary idea here, is that that is the supreme love, and that is the most important aspect of his message. Um, You know, the fact that his wife actually chose a more Vedic approach having been influenced by Indian gurus, is interesting. But at the same time, um, having studied what she was um, uh, preaching, you know, in her ashram in in, uh, Agora Hills, there was a very universalist idea there that there was a place for Jesus and Buddha and Allah and, you know, Muhammad, et cetera, all as being... uh, uh, you know, uh, um, incredible forces in connecting man to his divine, you know, spirit. And the, the, that which connects us all, the kind of uh, namaste idea, you know, that is um, uh, encompassed in that simple word. It seems to be that he was just this guy who was completely always searching for truths, never really relying on one particular truth and the fact that he was brought up religiously, um, you know, he didn't completely just adopt his upbringing. Well, he, did, he, you know, musically or spiritually, he did not discard ideas, you know? Right. So, you know, in the same way that, you know, a, a deep connection to the blues always kind of, um, uh, even in his most avant-garde and out uh, playing, there was always always a sense of the blues there. There was always a, a sense of, you know, also the impassioned music of the black church, 
you know, that ecstatic release idea was always in his playing, you know. And at the same time, I think spiritually, he did not do away with the most important messages that he took from his uh, African Methodist uh, upbringing in North Carolina. And that is, l- love is the supreme um, uh, connection that we have to each other and to the idea of a divine spirit within us. Um, and it's through that kind of, you know, um, as, as John McLaughlin would put it, inner mountain, mounting flame, you know, that is what connects us all. And that, that is, how do you explain it through, you know, uh, 300, 400 years of, of you know, the African-American experience in, in the new world? How do you explain it through the musical, um, uh, the incredible musical legacy that came out of that experience? And that was his challenge. That's the challenge he gave himself. And he said, well, I'm going to use some Western ideas. I'm going to use a lot of, you know, uh, the, the kind of energy and intensity that comes out of the black church. And I'm going to mix it all together with this sort of what I have learned in my lifetime, including um, uh, spiritual, you know, influences from the East. Yeah. And a love supreme is the result of all of that. I wonder how he would. Well, I think I can project. But the fact that there is a center, a religious center for in his honor, the Church of John Coltrane, right, in San Francisco. I think that would almost be somewhat appalling to him in a sense. I, I don't know if he'd be appalled. I think that he was just trying to tread very sensitively um, because, you know, the idea of him being held up as a saint-like figure, um, he himself said, you know, I'd like to be a saint, but I don't think he wanted to be deified. I think the idea of deification kind of works against the universalist idea of what he, he was about. Um, what's very interesting, and this is worth uh, checking out, is an interview he does a year after Love Supreme is released. Uh, it's in 1966, and he's speaking to students um, at what is kind of like the Japanese Harvard um, of the day. And it actually at this university, he he does an interview with one of the major media uh, Japanese media companies. Then he does an interview with a jazz journalist, and then he talks to the students. So it's like he's doing a whole interview day, a press day. But the last conversation he has with his students, they are pressing him about his religion, his idea of spiritual belief, you know, and trying to find the words. And it's probably Jap. Japanese students speaking through an interpreter. That's not included in what we have left from that uh, experience. But um, uh, there's a book called Coltrane on Coltrane, which is a collection of Coltrane's interviews, basically Coltrane's words. Um, um, Chris DeVito wrote it. And in it, you know, you can find him being very coy about even using the word God anymore. You know, he doesn't even want to say God, you know, it, it's, it's almost like he can see the pitfalls in language in trying to describe his spiritual path. So um, to go back to, to what you're saying, you know, I think, I think that anything, anytime that religion becomes kind of codified and there's a place for it, and this is the day the day in which you worship. I mean, the whole idea behind a love supreme is that divine connection happens anywhere between any any you know in any situation, and whether or not you consider yourself a religious person, you know that divine spirit is always there, you know, just by being human, you know. And I think that's that was the priority in what he was saying. So I'm not sure he would be so upset as to say, well, that's another path. 
yeah. and all paths lead to God. So I'm not going to take away from that path, you know. Uh, I'm just trying to include all of them together. There's an interesting moment uh, in the book where he, he, he does an interview of sorts, and I'm paraphrasing, but he does talk about how he'd almost like to, almost like in a godlike way, be able to create rain with his music or heal people through music. And it does give you a little indication that, you know, maybe music was beyond just music uh, in his mind. In- oh, absolutely. No, I mean, for him, it wasn't like, here's music, here's spirituality, here's, uh, you know, domestic life, here's my professional life, you know. The, it, it, it was all interwoven, you know. Um, the way that Elvin Jones would speak about him was that, you know, after just working with him for a few months, he realized this man walks and talks who he is all the time. You know, it's like he's an angel. Well, you know, that's a tough job if you assign yourself, I'm going to walk through the world as if I'm an angel. No, what it means is that your dedication and your spiritual, you know, connection is so rooted inside you that whatever you say, whatever you do, it's it connects to that kind of uh, the the flow chart of your day to day activities begins with this incredible spiritual uh, connection that you have to the world, you know, to who you are, to knowing why you're here on the planet. That's amazing to be around, you know. There's a few people who have that, you know. I'm, I mean, I would say that, you know, like Carlos Santana, it's, you know, he it, he has that power, you know, because he does walk through the world with that level of dedication. And, you know, I'm sure George Harrison, I know that Alice Coltrane had that, you know. <laughs> but these are, I'm just referring to like musical legends <laughs> who, who, who who continued with their kind of spiritual dedication. Yeah. And I wonder why there seems to have been a vagueness with um because it took a while to sort of make that discovery that he was reading that poem uh, um the final movie. I don't think there's a vagueness there. I think what there was was uh, um a kind of looseness in in the language that he used, you know. Um you know, uh, nowadays it, when you put together a project like this and if if jazz was recognized in the way it is now, if John Coltrane was recognized in the way that he is now, you know, I think that he would have had a much stronger support system around him. The world would have recognized, oh, my God, this guy is a genius. And we're going to be 50, 60, 70 years from now studying everything that he did. And um, uh, it's going to have an influence on everyone, then his language in the um, kind of instructions on how to listen to a love supreme, you know, um, would have been a little bit clearer. But he does try to describe what is happening, and he says it right there on the liner notes. He goes, you know, it it, it he doesn't use the word poem; he uses the word theme. And the problem with theme is that it also has a musical definition. You know, it means a, a certain melody, you know, and, and that's where I think the confusion happens. But he actually tried to write it out and intended to very, very clearly state these words on the album cover go with that last part of the suite, the part four, otherwise known as Psalm. Interesting. Yeah, I think um, vagueness is probably the incorrect word, and I, um, that that word theme is was the was the word that could be somewhat I don't want to say problematic, but like he never just flat out said I'm playing my poem for you. Sort of thought of it as like he's waiting for somebody to to figure it out, or he wanted to leave it somewhat open to interpretation and and self discovery. If there's one thing that's clear in the fact that he, the words that he chooses to title the pieces, the the fact that he writes a letter to the listener, he doesn't want to leave anything open to interpretation. 
he's 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 actually being as i mean he keeps hitting the point again and again why does he repeat the motif a love supreme as many times as he does he wants you to really really understand right he ain't kidding this is about a supreme a supreme love you know and that this is the ultimate of what we can speak about as, as, as humans, you know, I mean, you know, it's perhaps the highest thing that we can ever aspire to. Mm -hmm. It's not intellectuality. It's not, you know, it's love. It's pure, a pure form of love, sure. you know, and, yeah. and all the acceptance and tolerance and, you know, um, you know, <laughs> that, that it demands. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's pretty remarkable. And I guess it is very much clear once you have that realization that that's what he's doing. Yeah. He's trying to be as uninterpreted as possible, you know, and and leaving nothing, nothing for it. Because, you know, that's that's what happens with the Bible. It right. gets interpreted. <laughs> yeah. I think when you listen to it from it with a musician's ears, that's not your first you're thinking about the mute you're maybe not getting the whole being of the of the piece if you will it's like the first my first listen to a love supreme was yes this is there's something magical happening here that moves beyond music but right. but from music from a musical standpoint there's just some brilliant playing and interaction that's happening and having listened to album after album that doesn't necessarily have sort of a concept you kind of may may miss that until you get people analyzing or some people probably never even read the liner notes, you know, they just listen to the, to the brilliant music. But, well, you know, that's the problem now is yeah, as we're leaving physical formats behind and yes. most uh, people are getting the music online, you know, whether through streaming or YouTube videos or whatever, all, all the, even the credits, you know, as to who played on it, right. you know, are, are kind of disappearing. It's just name of tune, mm -hmm. you know, artist and the, and the tune itself. Yeah. And uh, which kind of returns us to the very, very beginnings of recorded music. Cause that's what it was like in the 78 RPM, uh, you know, stage. Yeah, that's true. And, and I think, so, sorry. No, no. I mean, and that's the purpose of your book, I think, and, and the podcast, which takes a look at specific albums and takes a little bit of a deeper look into them. And just the, the concept of a package, an album, a, a product that's, you know, and all or all art forms in a sense, maybe not you no know, acting or whatever, but you have an image that was very carefully chosen. You have words that were very carefully put on the, on the album, the, the way the songs are, particularly in Love Supreme, it couldn't be any other way, but the way the songs are organized on the record, that that lost art is, uh, it creates a certain sadness for me. <laughs> I know. Well, let's hope it's not lost because, you know, LP vinyl sales are, are up, you know. But but the idea really is, um, you know, that uh, there's, it's a doorway, you know, and it's a doorway that you're welcome to go into and go as deep as you want. You know, not everybody has to listen to a love supreme and write a book about it. And, you know, but I would invite further study. You know, I, I, I see my book, um, especially on a love supreme, which seems to be the, the one that has the, uh, the longest life now that I hear the most about is that it, it has inspired others to do the same with other recordings and has inspired others to take John Coltrane, um, uh, in a, a, you know, in a way and look, uh, regard him in a way that's, um, you know, I mean, I don't want to take personal credit for that, but adding to the idea that he is worthy of this kind of study and that we all benefit from going deeper into the areas that he kind of held the door open for us to, you know, it's worth doing. One of the things, Jay, that you brought up that in the email you sent me was the idea of the musicality of a love supreme. 
trying to get to that. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, and, and I want to make sure that we cover that because, you know, uh, it, it's, it's so easy just to talk about uh, John Coltrane's message, but his music and the way that he developed naturally, right. organically, authentically uh, his own sound with, you know, the, the huge help of the, the musicians that we now call the classic quartet, finding the, the, the right kind of support in Jimmy Garrison on bass, McCoy Tyner on piano, um, Elvin, of course, on drums, who, you know, was his partner in, in levels of intensity, you know. Right. Um, you know, you can hear the, the kind of uh, tunes especially the original tunes that he's working on through uh, the early 60s before he kind of develops um, what he wants to do. You know, uh, one, one of the most interesting things that I've found after, you know, I wrote the book was, of course, the sheet music with his handwritten instructions on how the whole suite would go. Right. So that in in on this one page, you've got all four parts of the suite, you know, with little kind of uh, Coltrane-isms because he's not using Italian terminology, you know, for the music. But he's describing, you know, I want to play the motif, i.e. the four-note sequence, a love supreme, in all keys. He reminds himself to do that. Then he, he's uh, talking about uh, other aspects of, uh, and you can see like the resolution theme written out and pursuance, you know. Mm -hmm. And then he writes a note to himself that I want this to end like Alabama. And he, he refers to it as um, this blissful moment. So he's using his own recording from a year ago something that if you listen to it sounds like he's kind of putting it together in the studio. So it was a studio moment when a certain lightning got caught in the bottle to use an overused cliche, you know, but that moment for him represented what he'd like to recreate at yes. the very end of a love Supreme. I wanted to end as I was able to accomplish back then. And there's no word for it. You know, uh, blissful harmony. That's that's what he calls it. How he writes it out on this note to self, you know. Um, and uh, so his self awareness as a musician of what he had himself had been able to accomplish so right. far. He had, uh, only passed recordings to reference it to. You know, um, it was not written out musically. It was described using language. Right. Yeah. I mean, as I almost look at um, like Crescent and uh, Live at Birdland and particularly songs like Wise One, Alabama. Oh, yeah. As a, as a, a prequel to what he was going to accomplish on a love suit. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can go far as far back as Naima, you know, yeah. uh, and, and, and bits and pieces of other tunes around that time uh, for that kind of spiritual element that he would, um, uh, you know, take such great advantage of and use to, to the benefit of his own music later. But part of it, I think, is, is stuff like, um, you know, uh, quieting down the, uh, the, I mean, certainly modal, you know, the idea of quieting down the harmonic movement, sure. um, long tones, I mean, if you hear some uh, saxophonist playing long tones in a minor key and the drummer is using mallets, right. at this point, immediately, we think, oh, spiritual, spiritual jazz. Right, you know, right. You know, that's, that's, that's the new vocabulary that he was inventing at the time. Back then, they would say, oh, that's such a pretty ballad you were playing. You know, who were you thinking of? You know, what's her name? You know, but now over time, you know, we have been taught to think about that music as something that is deeply spiritual, you know, and and it's 
all because of John Coltrane, you know, and him recognizing in his playing, you know, oh, that works. Oh, that really works. Oh, that ending to Naima with that ascending, you know, kind of feel, you know, yeah, that really yeah. works. And you brought it up earlier. I think you, uh, a lot of credit has to be given to the group. I mean, just them giving themselves totally into Coltrane's c- concepts. And he really did find the right formula. Those, the right, and he took a while to find it. Those yeah. three individuals. And then even with that, he decided to re-record it, re-record some of the material the next day, adding two musicians, which obviously was a big surprise <laughs> To I know. Of, how could you, how could you, it's perfect. You know, I mean, um, well, you know, I asked Alice Coltrane about that. She goes, Oh no, I remember him bringing back, you know, the recordings from both days on these small little three inch reels, you know, kind of like audition, uh, uh, um, tapes that he would get from Rudy. And it was clear that he was happier with the quartet version and the sextet with Archie and Dr. Art Davis added, you know, it just didn't work. But, you know, you think that was the last time he tried that. He did meditations first as a quartet, then as a quintet or vice versa, I forget. But, um, you know, and then they put out the quartet version, you know, um, uh, that was in 65, later in 65. But the idea that, uh, you know, it, this kind of works against, you know, the idea that music is something that is locked in stone and, you know, you you can't mess around with it, even though the world, you know, and I'm talking about, you know, uh, modern day players are very hesitant to approach a love supreme unless it's the right yes. kind of context, you know, and you do just a piece of it. You know, can you take resolution and just do that? Right. I think John Coltrane, in the way that he approached all of his music, was sort of something that was in the moment, you know? Right. Nothing, it, it's not like, you know, the flag can't touch the ground or something. <laughs> yeah, but you know, yet I know that myself and, and the people who I associate with musically, none of us would ever dare to touch a love supreme. We would, we'll do the... You know, that quote will filter in inevitably because it's a four note pattern that's just like right. that part of our ether now, now right? right? But of course, it, it is held on a certain level, a certain pedestal that you just like, that's beyond. It's beyond what should be reinterpreted. Re, yeah. You know. and, and you know, that four note sequence preceded a love supreme, right. you know? I mean, um, if you go to, a, there's an Art Farmer prestige album, um, and and I'm forgetting the title, but the, the name of the track is Mau Mau. Mm-hmm. And under a very obvious kind of Latin habanera kind of feel, uh, right. they start playing that, that sequence. And this is like 53, 54, something like that. And that just may be uh, a situation where I don't obviously I don't think it's purely coincidental, but you know, as musicians, we hear things and they just become part of our vocabulary. We don't really. It's not like we're trying to borrow even uh, necessarily. And I wonder. I, I I don't. I wouldn't imagine that he had that remembrance of that particular song to put it into that that love supreme theme. No, he. It, it's obvious what he's doing. Right. He doesn't. He does all of Psalm, where he is taking the words and he's pulling from the words a certain cadence, phrasing, you know, articulation, and translating it onto saxophone. Right. It's that simple, you know. He did it with with you know with Alabama. Apparently, he used having heard a speech by Martin Luther King after the bombing in Birmingham. In, in 1963, there are certain cadence, some words that he repeated. Also, he's coming out of a very, very deep and rich, um, you know, African American preaching tradition. Not singing, preaching, and preaching is spoken word. 
delivered in musical, lyrical fashion for the sake of, 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 of getting through all the filters that we have and using that Sunday morning to like blast through and get into your heart and, and, and get you to get the message, whatever it is, change your life if you need to. But, you know, again, this goes back to why would he just go a love supreme, a love supreme, a love supreme, a love supreme. Well, there's the power and the mantra, you know, coming from Eastern idea, but it's also like, you know, a preacher repeating right. him or herself in order to get it across. Have right. I made my point clear? Great. Thank you. Don't forget to, you know, leave something in the, uh, in the, uh, you know, in the bucket on the way out and, and have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. You know? An old advertising trick, you know, repeat, repeat the product, repeat, repeat the message, repeat the message. Exactly. Exactly. But, but in this case, with a very clear altruistic, you know, intent that, you know, I don't want you to miss this. It really is about a love. And, mm-hmm. and the love that I'm talking about is not a romantic love. It's not physical love. It's, you know, it's supreme. Yeah. You know? And that is kind of open to interpretation too. But I think that we all get the idea that, you know, it is the most powerful force out there. That's what he's saying to us. Right. And then again, um, in terms of just the timeline, I, I mean, obviously, I think the impact of music often has a lot to do with when it's released, what's going on historically. Um, the state of America, 1964, 1963, 1964, 1965, in fact, you know, so under, there's a lot of turmoil there, racially, politically. Well, there was, uh, if you're African-American, you know, one would say civil rights, you know, the civil rights era, that's every year, you know. So, you know, I, I would just say that we've we've got to be careful about how we talk about it from what perspective. But the idea that in the 60s there was a, a very tumultuous uh, period not only in dealing with, you know, race relations, but social um, uh, progress, you know, the changing of ideals, um, the generational kind of battle that, right. that was pitched back then, the, the kind of uh, um, explosion of youth culture. All of that actually, if you think about it, is much more about the late 60s, just as John Coltrane leaves us. Yeah. So the most tumultuous stuff not just the you know march on washington but more the black power struggles of the late 60s that's sort of the images and ideas that we associate with the 60s are much more about just as coltrane departs but you're absolutely right that you know the button that john coltrane was hoping to push was happening at just the right time when a lot of questions that dealt with, you know, why are we here? How are we supposed to live on this planet together? Um, You know, we're being asked by people who had kind of like wanted, you know, society had wanted to paint over that stuff and say, isn't this the great society? Aren't aren't things just so incredibly nice and perfect, you know? And then you had the Vietnam War, you had, uh, you know, the, the, the unrest in a lot of urban centers in America and the incredible disparity, you know, between races, between, you know, uh, the haves and the have nots that continues today to an extreme, you know, uh, but back then it was suddenly all of this was right there front and center and you couldn't ignore it anymore. And there needed to be music that, that would have, you know, at least try and make sense out of all this chaos and right. love Supreme arrived at just the right time. Yeah. And like, obviously a lot more difficult to do with instrumental music. Um, of course we have, I think, you know, Bob Dylan's vo- voice was very clear. You know, we're coming off the so aftermath true. of John Coleman's assassination, uh, the Civil Rights Act in 1964, you know, Malcolm X dies in 1965, assassinated. Yeah. All, you know, is part of the 
love Supreme package, I think, just in the sense of when it came out and just how impactful it was and still is, you know. Well, I mean, you you kind of hit the hit it right on the nose right there. If you're an instrumental, uh, uh, if you're an instrumentalist, you know, someone whose music is primarily without a lyric, you know, uh, you have to invent that lyric. You know, you have to find ways of getting that lyric into your music or around your music. And today, there are brilliant, brilliant examples of some very socially minded, um, message driven uh, performers within the world of jazz. Let's just talk about jazz, you know. But someone like Terry Lynn Carrington, who brings in uh, not just a singer, but a singer and an MC who's going to rap verses, and you have a singer as well, and I'm going to call the band Social Science, you know? Right. And every tune that I do has a title or, and or lyrics that deal with uh, the social issues and the, the, the you know, cultural message that I want to get across. Or you have someone like Christian Scott, you know, Chief Ajua, um, he's performing as, you know, he... Um, takes the time out of a typical 70 to 90 minute set time in a jazz club, there will be an inordinate, I mean, an unusually uh, a, a, a generous amount of talk <laughs> that he offers from the stage. And he practically turns, you know, the jazz uh, stage into a pulpit, you know, and, and he always makes great sense. Or Jose James is on that same level, you know, and uh, Lakeisha Benjamin, you know, all who are drawing incredibly from the, the, the source point being John Coltrane, the idea of music and message together, you know, that this is just not me providing, you know, uh, um, entertainment for your Saturday night but that I want to le- allow you by tomorrow to have your life changed mm-hmm. by the music and the message I'm giving to you. I mean, that's a huge, you know, can you, can you imagine, you know, someone like a, um, you know, baseball or, or, or Broadway musical or whatever, I trying so. to ha- accomplish that kind of thing or having that goal in mind. Right. That's really, you know, how, how, you know, ambitious <laughs> boldly ambitious this this effort was and right. why why we need to like you know give it the respect it deserves sometimes the power and as i talk about this as well with my with my students with instrumental music the uh, the power of a program or, or just even a title alabama if he didn't title that alabama we might have lost the meaning of that song you know but he makes it clear. It's just about what happened in Alabama. Love Supreme. Clearly, you know that it's something more than just a musical experience here. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that Alabama was recorded uh, same year that Nina Simone recorded Mississippi Goddamn. <laughs> you know? But again, Nina's working with the benefit of um, a lyric. So we know exactly, you know, what she's saying. Um and she's very vocal. And she's right. And she's very vocal. Okay. You know, John, John Coltrane, who knows, you know, I mean, it was getting to the point where a lot of people were beating their way to John's door just before he passed. There's that famous uh, 1966 interview that Frank Kofsky, mm-hmm. who's very leftist in his politics and who finds a connection between his Marxist ideology and avant-garde jazz and uh, uh, attempts to kind of paint, paint it all together is the same intent. Um, you know, he does an extended interview with John Coltrane. I, I, I would not have been surprised had John Coltrane lived that by 68, 69, he would have been <laughs> dealing with endless interview requests. And to, to speak of his music following I Love Supreme. The next several albums released, the quartet plays, right? I think was the next one. Which is his last album in which he records anyone else's music. I think Nature Boy and Chim Chim Cheree are the last two 
studio recordings in which he does other people's music. I mean, he continues to perform, um, you know, my favorite things, you know, everyone's got to do their hits. But of course, he, he, he switches it out and changes it around so much that right. by 1967, you hardly recognize that that's what he's playing. But the idea is that, you know, a Love Supreme is kind of a, land, a line in the sand as far as his saying goodbye to the ballads and the other tunes, you know, love tunes of uh, 32 bar structure and 12 bar blues, etc. Although the sense of the blues he retains, you know, mm-hmm. but the idea of these forms and structures and other people's writing becomes something of the past. And after Love Supreme, he is really focused on the message music that he has adopted and the idea of finding melodies and almost codes, Mm -hmm. you know, the idea of um, using harmonic sequences and intervallic, you know, uh, motifs like the one, three, one, four, which is a love supreme, you know, as ways of creating music. So he's going back to the going down to a kind of DNA level, you know, yeah. and generating the music up from that, you know, kind of sensibility, you know. Yeah, but it seems like with the Love Supreme, I mean, I feel like he almost took the I wouldn't say the average listener, but the he almost took it as far as most people were willing to accept. I, I think for in, in some regard. Um, I, I was I was interested in your impressions on ascension meditations, perhaps. Because there were times, this is a time now where he's playing with a lot of times a large ensemble on stage as well. And uh, people are walking out, you know, people are not accepting these long form improvisations that are very dense. Well, you know, uh, uh, a lot of people said that the, you know, uh, or some people have said that the difference between Miles Davis avant garde and John Coltrane's avant garde was basically a sense of groove. Um, when John Coltrane's, the, the one thing that he did in wanting to go further with his music, and basically he's kind of conceptualizing the music. You know, when, when he says, I want to play this thing in all modes, all, you know, uh, possible, um, you know, uh, tones, you know, he's basically what he's saying is that I'm universal in my philosophy. Let me apply that to the rules of music. Well, the one thing that would, it was the, the kind of non, uh, um, I don't want to call it arrhythmic, but um, John called it multi-rhythmic drumming that, you know, especially uh, Rashid Ali Mm -hmm. is most, you know, uh, as an avant-garde drummer, um, you know, brought into the thing. Had he been able to keep at least that, you know, had he had Elvin stayed and was able to keep a more consistent beat going, a groove, you know, I think he would have been more successful in reaching, you know, a large audience. But that was not his priority. You know, he wasn't thinking that way. And, you know, if he is going to have the freedom as a player to play in and out of all keys, why would a drummer, why would the, you know, who's ever handling, you know, percussion and and keeping time not be able to hit all time, you know, multi-rhythms, as as he put it. Even even Elvin and and, uh, McCoy, you know, they... It was, I don't want to say beyond them, but they did, they didn't accept the approach. You know, they they felt the need to leave at that time. I think you're right. I mean, they they've been very clear about that. That they felt they were, you know, they were very much in love with they had they had been able to create with a classic quartet. You know, what's amazing about Alabama? What's amazing about a Love Supreme? These are all first take efforts, mm-hmm. and he would maybe go through the head once before the the tape you know deck started rolling you know in the in the studio but they were so in tune with each other by 1963 64 
that this classic quartet really kind of breathed the same musical air, vocabulary was something that they shared and had created themselves. It, it, you know, and 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 to kind of they felt they were that you know John in moving forward was turning his back on on that concept, but you know he he had more higher peaks to climb, you know, and there was no turning back. What he wanted, and he said this in interviews, was I want to keep the quartet and I want to do this other thing too, and yeah. of course you know. The, the financial and, you know, time limitations, et cetera, were, would not have allowed that to happen. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think they were willing to go with, with Coltrane on a journey up to a certain point. And then, um, and it, and then I, I do feel like that, that loss of Elvin Jones and. Well, they, they weren't hearing the music the way that John Coltrane was. They were hearing the music as far as what they had invented within the classic quartet. And that was beautiful, and John didn't want to say goodbye to that. But at the same time, John was more compelled by what he was envisioning. And a lot of it had to do, like I said, with concept as much as it was with the music. Right. And and not only were they not hearing it, the general jazz public, I think, had also were starting to move away from it. I know for myself... I, I listen to that stuff and I try to make sense of it and I'm fairly knowledgeable about music. And, um, I think it's beyond, I don't think it's not good music. Uh, it's, I think it's beyond my, my understanding. I think John Coltrane is a guy who is just beyond me, you know? Yeah. I, you know, it's, 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 it's an interesting thing you bring up because, you know, I have been to so many avant-garde jazz performances and there's such a huge difference between between being in the live you know moment and trying to understand it from a recording first of all you know being there and having the music kind of flowing through you and learning how to let the music flow through you and not resist you know is is part of i think getting used to any style of music you know and, and when I first was encountering opera or classical music, I, I, I saw a barrier between us. But right. now, you know, it's like how to st- open yourself t- to sound is is part of the avant-garde experience, I think. Yeah. Um, it's a physical, you know, thing that you that you go through with it, especially when it's what we call energy music. You know, but the other thing is that I think, um, you know, that, uh, you know, it's 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 like what you get used to when you're of a certain age. And if you are encountering avant garde jazz energy music, let's say between the ages of 13 and 14 and say 23, you're a sponge in that period. Your retention of melodies, of performers, of musical information is going to be there for the rest of your life. You're going to remember that period. And so if you are fortunate enough to come up in the days when avant-garde music was new, exciting, hip, Mm -hmm. good-looking, you know, women and and guys were always around it, you know, you, you... that's what you get attached to. Same with hip hop, same with R and B, same with, you know, this or that, you know? Um, So I think that uh, that has a lot to do with it too. But ultimately, you know, um, there are certain scary moments, you know, in, uh, in Coltrane's kind of catalog, chasing the train, you know, which has no identifiable theme, it's very loose kind of blues structure. Mm-hmm. McCoy's laying out, but the energy of it and the playing of it right now, it, it, you, it doesn't scare like it once did. It wasn't, you know, at one point it was scary and it caused a lot of confusion and 
you know, some very, you know, erudite uh, uh, critics to call it anti-jazz and to really put down not only Coltrane, but Dolphy, who was with him at the time, you know, for what they were doing. And yet you listen to it now and it sounds so quaint and it's like, you know, you can get into the energy of it. Sure. I mean, the same could be said for Dixieland music when it came out. You know, people, the critics thought it was the most outlandish thing ever. And now you play it for, for your students and they're like, you know, well, I don't yeah, know. Right. <laughs> Where, where's the danger? You know? Yeah, right. You know, you know, in 1922, it was like, you know, the Visigoths are banging on the gates. <laughs> Civiliz- civilization is over. But I, I do think, and I, I don't want to keep you too long, but I do think it's a, it's a very fair point and an accurate point that being part of the experience, being in the audience for some of the live recordings is a truly different thing. And yeah. I know having the opportunity to have played in that context, it is a, there is an energy in the room. And the, the issue with playing in that context very often is it takes a while to get to those moments. You have to, you have to be patient because it's so perfect. So true. But I mean, here's the thing, you know, John Coltrane's um, uh, uh, longtime producer at Impulse, who went through him, through that period with him, you know, um, when when he was getting more and more spiritual, increasingly uh, avant-garde and leaving all the ballads behind was Bob Thiel. Bob Thiel spent the rest of his life, even after he left Impulse and the ABC uh, label that owned it and went on in its own kind of path, starting two different labels. His son, who is in the music business, uh, he did the music for um, Sons of Anarchy. So he's a music supervisor and director uh, in, in L.A., um, still to this day, he goes, I don't understand dad's ear for avant-garde jazz, but he taught himself how to listen and to recognize value and mm-hmm. really great players within that world. And so when he worked later with those who kind of inherited Coltrane's energy and intensity, he says, I remember him playing, playing us Arthur Blythe. You know, when he was he was in his 20s, his dad must have been in his 60s at that point or or 50s. And he was like, Dad, I don't get it. You know, what are you hearing? And he said, no, this is. And sure enough, Arthur Blythe was still one of the most powerful voices to come out of, you know, edgy New York jazz in the late 70s and 80s. Yeah, no, it's it's amazing. So if um, kind of blue, you did the book on that. And then this album. So, what would be the th- what would be a third album? Well, you know that I, I, I'll turn the question back to you. You know, what would you want to read about that where there's like stories and history and a and and a kind of enduring respect and embrace of of a single recording? And I say that not facetiously. I mean it sincerely because th- this is something that I think about all the time. First of all, the idea of albums is starting to go away, you know, sure. especially yeah. in the, these days of streaming and playlists. Yes. And in a way, I kind of like that. I find it exciting because people are not thinking or listeners are not thinking in the same categorical kind of, um, you know, it's got to be music of a certain time period, of a certain style. Now it's it's... You know, you've got this huge uh, uh, wealth of of recordings, one click away, boom. You know, don't have to go out to the used record store. Don't have to hunt it down online. You know, it's right there in the streaming platform. And other people are creating playlists for each other, and they're going drag, drop, drag, drop, drag, drop, boom. Here's here's what I want you to listen to. And it'll be muse. Delta blues from the twenties and big band stuff from the thirties and like hip hop from last week, you know, all in the same playlist. I love that. You know? Yeah, I can agree with you on that. Um, in terms of jazz album, I want to answer your question. <laughs> okay. In terms of jazz albums, there's two that come to mind. Okay. 
Ornette Coleman, Shape of Jazz to Come. Sure. Would be, would be maybe my next thought. Or um, Charles Mingus is... Uh, um, Actually, both of them would be amazing because especially with Mingus, uh, um, it, it satisfies that idea of a self-portrait, you know, right. who I am through my music and everything from his political standpoint to who his heroes are to his approach to the blues versus gospel kind of line that is always there in, in, in black America, the idea of sacred versus worldly music and sacred versus worldly pursuits. All of that is encompassed in, yes. in that one album. It, it is a masterpiece. I agree with you. It deserves that uh, book length treatment. Um, the shape of jazz to come. I, I think the music is fantastic. I love that music. It's enduring, you know, um, it, it speaks to the coming of a very avant-garde intellectual, um, um, you know, aspect to the music. Um, and, and, but I would see it more as, as speaking to Ornette's story, you know, right. that it was just one little point that you, you could do the same thing with one of the contemporary albums, even before he got to New York. But you'd want to include the New York arrival. So, yeah, I think that this is me speaking as a writer, yeah. you know, because you, you want, you know, paths to go down. You want uh, stories and backstories and, and tangents and, you know, yeah. asides that just add flavor and uh, um, dimensionality, you know, to a story. And, and and then have it, you know, come together to some final point or message. And I think I think either one of those would work. You know, I, I think those are good choices. Well, I guess get to work, man. <laughs> are, are you assigning this to me? Is there a contract for me to sign? <laughs> I'm working on my own stuff. <laughs> I wish. Right. Someday. Right. Someday. Well, when you need help with on what music to do, you can come to me. I'll tell you what to do. <laughs> I'm just trying to get this Ray Brown book. It's I'm, I'm just kidding. But, but you know, oh, I, I, um, you know, the, the, the I, you know, there's a bu book creation is its own kind of path, you know. And, and so, uh, uh, as much as I was saying that albums are sort of like moving on into an era of playlists. I think books are moving on too. What you're seeing is an incredible amount of documentaries out there now. Right. And so books are now kind of fading a little bit and the documentary approach and the fact that there's so many platforms, streaming services, et cetera, that are hungry for content. But at the same time, the cost of creating documentaries is is much more approachable um is is uh it's becoming more of the way of of uh, getting inf musical information out there musical histories and i shouldn't say just documentaries i mean you think about some of the uh, influencers on youtube like a rick beato right. or um uh what's his face the bass player um uh he's like the uh music yeah. harmony detective um is it yeah. Neil? Yes, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. I can't see his face. Yes, right. Uh, but but you know that the idea that um, you know the the digital revolution followed by the internet explosion <laughs> is, is reformatting our lives, and we got to be aware of that. And so um, you know um, the budgets that m used to be available for, for making books happen are much more available for, you know, a book and a documentary and a documentary series, you know, that sort of thing. Absolutely. So just tell me, um, what you're working on now, what do you have coming out? Um, working on a book <laughs> that I can't talk about just yet. Um, uh, two documentaries, a uh, couple of articles that I've been inside, and then um, I do still do my teaching at NYU um, at the Clive Davis uh, Institute for Recorded Music. Uh, my next class is on Led Zeppelin, 
and uh, um, and then I do, you know, uh, I go around to festivals and I do interviews, public interviews, public panel discussions, uh, stuff like that. And the Dolphy, um, the Dolphy Coltrane recording, that's? Oh, that's right. <laughs> I wasn't sure when this was airing. So, yeah, by the uh, third week of July, uh, this recently uh, discovered tape recording that no one knew about was at the New York Public Library. And it had it was just a couple of nights uh, from the summer of 1961. So you see Coltrane's uh, ideas developing. He doesn't have the classic quartet together yet. Uh, you know, Reggie Workman is on bass and soon Jimmy, and he'll soon be replaced by Jimmy Garrison. And Dolphy is still in the band and Dolphy will leave. But that's how the classic quartet comes together by the end of uh, 1961. But this is six months before at a bunch of like very, um, I, I don't think they were well attended uh, uh, performances, but they were uh, for that summer, the village gate was kind of a home for um, John Coltrane. And so this very special couple of nights there, um, the the recording engineer or the uh, sound engineer for the club actually recorded what was going on there, and now it's coming out. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you for your time, Ashley. Did I miss anything? Uh, no, I think we covered a lot, and we spoke for what, like a little over an hour. It feels like it was five minutes. I really enjoyed this. I'm glad it wasn't tedious. So, Jay, not with you. Come on, man. <laughs> you know, you know your stuff. I, I, I always enjoy speaking with you. It was a pleasure, man. We'll do it again sometime. I look forward. All right. Thanks again. All right. So there you have it. That's my conversation with Ashley Khan. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. It seemed like Ashley did as well and did show an interest in returning for future programs, which I hope happens. So thanks again, Ashley Khan. So that concludes part number one of this two-part series. Again, in part two, I will offer my impressions of of the record, followed by a track-by-track analysis of the four-part suite. So check out part number two of A Love Supreme. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to our discussion on John Coltrane's A Love Supreme. This is part two of the two-part series. Now for me, the success and the brilliance of A Love Supreme were coming together of four main factors. The first factor is the unification of Coltrane's experiences and studies as a musician. Much of this development came when he was a member of Miles Davis's quintet. During his tenure, Coltrane was given ample opportunities to improvise and work out new ideas in real time. And he also gained a more profound knowledge of playing using a less harmonically rich modal approach, particularly when the group recorded Kind of Blue. Let me explain. So this modal technique allows solos to play over a specific scale for a longer period of time. This frees the improviser from trying to navigate through rapidly moving chord changes. Another key figure who helped to shape Coltrane's development was the pianist and composer Thelonious Monk. After being fired by Miles Davis in 1957, Coltrane joined Monk's band, and the two spent hours discussing, playing, and analyzing musical structures. Train was also deeply interested and connected to the musicians who helped popularize avant-garde music in jazz in the late 1950s and early 1960s. This includes Eric Dolphy and Ornette Coleman. And finally, the saxophonist can now also look at his own 1960s releases, such as Giant Steps, My Favorite Things, Live at Birdland, and Crescent. These albums moved beyond some of the innovations of Miles Davis's band and often included extended solos and original materials written by John Coltrane. A second major factor to the album's success was John Coltrane's fascination with religion and philosophy. Although he was born into the Christian faith and went to church every Sunday to hear his grandfather, the Reverend William Blair, preach, John Coltrane studied multiple religions by 1957 and never prescribed to any one 
religious practice. He was open to all possibilities. Another contributing factor to the album's success was the unity created by John Coltrane's quartet. By this point, pianist McCoy Tyner had perfected a specific way of voicing chords known as fourth voicings. This way of playing created a sense of openness and possibilities within the music, and it allowed John Coltrane to further explore. Tyner was also a brilliant secondary soloist. Drummer Elvin Jones's polyrhythmic approaches and ability to play with an incredible reserve of controlled energy, while also showcasing sensitivity when appropriate, was also key to the group's overall sound. And then bassist Jimmy Garrison had developed an ability and a confidence to shift from broken to more straight time feels, while also exploring unaccompanied solos that included double stop figures. The final key factor was the state of America and the world during the time in which A Love Supreme was recorded and released. In 1964, the year in which the album was recorded, the country was still dealing with the aftermath of John F. Kennedy's assassination and the new possibilities and struggles associated with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Also, America was involved in Vietnam at this point, and in music, the arrival of the Beatles and other British invasion bands changed the cultural landscape. In 1965, the year in which A Love Supreme was released, Malcolm X was assassinated. Martin Luther King's marches often led to violence, particularly at the Bloody Sunday event at Selma, Alabama, and the U.S. increased its involvement in Vietnam. The seriousness, openness, and freedom of Coltrane's music connected now with the social and political events of the day and to listeners of all races and ages. All right, so at this point, between my conversations with Ashley Kahn and my own words, I've talked an awful lot about John Coltrane and A Love Supreme. So now it's finally time to listen to the music. Now, as I mentioned previously, it's a four-part suite, so it's meant to be heard in its entirety. But for the purposes of analysis, we will break up each part of the suite, and part one is called Acknowledgement. Acknowledgement begins with Elvin Jones hitting a Chinese gong cymbal, which is an instrument you don't hear on any other John Coltrane recording. The gong creates seriousness, openness, and a connection to Eastern music and philosophy. John Coltrane then quickly enters with a flurry of notes against cymbal rolls and open sounding piano chords. It is almost as if Coltrane and the band are welcoming his listeners or his congregation, signaling that a sermon is about to begin. Bassist Jimmy Garrison then enters with the famous four note bass ostinato theme. That's that a love supreme theme while Coltrane waits in the wings. Now listen for that. Coltrane then begins preaching through the saxophone against the ostinato bass line. A unique Latin style beat is created by Elvin Jones. This connects to the polyrhythmic drumming of Africa, the way he plays. McCoy Tyner, the pianist, continues to play open sounding chord voicings. The time feel is unique and it creates a rhythmic backdrop that is specific but it's also loose and elastic at the same time. John Coltrane pours his soul into his improvisation. His playing grows dynamically, and at times he overblows the horn to create a specific level of intensity. There is a dynamic arc to his solo. At around four minutes and 45 seconds, Coltrane plays the four note A Love Supreme theme and transposes it into different keys. According to biographer and my mentor, Lewis Porter, 
John Coltrane does this to signify that God is everywhere. As Coltrane's saxophone fades out, he begins the Love Supreme chant, and he later overdubs his voice. Jimmy Garrison ends the first moment. Jimmy Garrison ends the first movement by continuing to play the theme, and eventually the rest of the band stops as Garrison moves into the next part or the next movement. The second track, or part two of the suite, is titled Resolution. It begins as Garrison continues his bass solo by playing these double stops, which are kind of bass chord figures. Then Coltrane enters with force and passion, offering the main theme. Of all of the four parts of the suite, Resolution was the most familiar to the group as they had performed the movement in jazz clubs before recording it. After Coltrane presents the theme against Elvin Jones's polyrhythmic swing approach and Garrison's sometimes pedaled bass lines, that's like a repeated bass note, McCoy Tyner solos. And like Train, he is expressive, he is experimental, and he's just absolutely brilliant. Tyner is truly the perfect pianist to service John Coltrane's vision. Jones and Garrison then move into a more traditional walking swing feel during the piano solo. At times, Elvin Jones locks into Tyner's rhythmic concept and accents along with him. Coltrane re-emerges at around the four minute mark and builds his solo by again offering some overblown statements and short phrases that are perfectly connected. The rhythm section picks up on Coltrane's energy and adds to it. John Coltrane ends the piece by smoothly shifting back to the theme before bringing resolution to its final resting point. There were several takes of the tune before we get to the one that is offered on this recording. Resolution. So if you had the original LP, if you were listening to this back in 1965, you would be flipping the record and dropping the needle on side two, which would conclude the suite. And for side two, Train puts two tracks together, or two movements together without break, and that would be Pursuance and Psalm. Later on, when it comes to digital formats or CDs or what have you, these two tracks were often separated, and we will do that. So track three is Pursuance. Pursuance opens with Elvin Jones playing an unaccompanied 90-second drum solo, in which he leaves little space. Without a resting point, he then shifts to a fast swing time feel. Coltrane quickly plays the melody and drops off as McCoy Tyner plays a solo that displays his ability to create over fast tempos. As his playing showcases his personalized style of voicing chords somewhat ambiguously, those fourth voicings which leave a certain sense of openness. He's also playing fast melodic runs in the right hand. He is truly a remarkable performer. Coltrane enters around the four minute and 20 second mark and comes in with extreme fire and force, almost like a sprinter waiting for the starting gun to go off. Throughout his solo, he builds along a number of motifs and plays with an energy and an urgency that few could ever hope to replicate. Matching his intensity is Elvin Jones and the rest of the rhythm section. As the saxophonist ends his solo, the band appears to be ending the movement, but Jones continues to play. Then Garrison sneaks back in for an unaccompanied bass solo in which he continues to offer those double stopped chorded figures at times. And he also makes reference to the Love Supreme theme. Although not the most technical of bassists, Garrison is certainly skilled and is often most impressive during these moments in which he solos without the backing of the band. He plays with confidence and a sense of exploration that truly matches Coltrane's concepts at the time. The fourth and final movement is Psalm. Psalm begins with a timpani roll, and then John Coltrane joins in almost immediately. At first listen, it is obvious that Coltrane is deep in thought and spirit, but due to the lack of a definitive time feel, 
the music seems nebulous and not particularly structured. On the liner notes of the album, John Coltrane included an original poem in which he gives thanks to God. As Lewis Porter discovered and wrote in his book on John Coltrane, Coltrane is reciting that poem through his saxophone. He's playing the words, but through his sax. And this was one of the great discoveries regarding the album. And it serves as yet another reference to John Coltrane's absolute creativity and genius. Now you can go on YouTube and check this out. There are videos in which you can see John Coltrane's words along with what he's playing. It scrolls together. And I would recommend that you do that. All right, my friends, we did it. We made it to the end of this record, and no doubt we are better for it. So lift the needle off of the record, put it away carefully, because you are going to want to return to this one, I'm sure. And let's just discuss a little further. So even though the music was made on December 9th, 1964, that was the session that makes up the entire record. And it was a magical day, a magical section. And the music seems perfect. Well, Coltrane was always searching, and he made a decision to re-enter the studio the next day to try another version. In doing so, he added two more musicians to enhance the sound. Saxophonist Archie Shep and bassist Art Davis were brought in. This session was not heard for a long, long time. It remained in the vaults. It was eventually unearthed, revealing two alternate versions of Acknowledgement. These versions are certainly more heavily layered, but it is apparent that Coltrane made the right choice to stick with the quartet versions. In conclusion, John Coltrane's A Love Supreme is like no other record ever made. It's timeless, it's emotional, it's musically brilliant, and it's deeply spiritual, even to those who question the existence of a higher power. It is a work of art of the highest order and must be regarded as one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century. All right, my friends, I want to thank you for checking out the episode, John Coltrane's A Love Supreme, the first of 30 albums that we will discuss in season number two. I also want to thank Ashley Kahn for joining me on this episode. For all things Ashley Kahn, you can do a search on him, but I will put a link to his, uh, to his website as well on our 30 Albums for 30 Years website. I hope you check that out. Additionally, you can reach out to me through multiple social media sources. We're on Facebook and, and Instagram, doing some things on TikTok as well. And these programs are also available on YouTube. So you can check out my interview with Ashley Khan there. Um, you can see the video of that as well. So together... Let's keep this music alive. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And I hope you join me for episode number two. Peace.